for that workshop, the session meeting. Okay. Anything else? I have some questions on 3-3, so I'd like to pull that. Okay. Anyone in the audience wish to pull anything to talk about? All right, so we have approval of the other items. <laughs> the other items, right. That would be the remaining three point one and all the one three point one through three point eight except three point three and three point seven. And three point one please. Point two. two. One two. Yeah. No. I'll second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. Okay, three one two. Anyone wish to make any comments about that or we just want to vote on it? Uh. <clears throat> I move approval of three one two. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And you abstain, correct? I abstain. Okay. All right, 3-3. Three, three. On the warrants? Yeah, my computer's down. Let's go to 3-7 while I try and okay. get this up. Okay, so um, there just I had a question about the La Selva Beach one. Um, just it said there was, um, was it the trench and the pavement that failed or the pipe? <coughs> no, it's the, it's the pavement. Okay. It's that was my old, question. Old asphalt, but it is our trench, so we're responsible for it. Okay. And then the other thing is the motion listed for board action is the incorrect motion. So I thought I should bring it out for that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, the motion would be to uh, approve a transfer from OCR uh, in the amount of uh, $45,000 to fund the pavement repair in the Salva Beach. I will make that motion. I'll second it. So motion second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. So I had three three polled. Um, the first one is on page one of that, page 38 of 249. Um, most of the way down, there's core and main LP, a two inch octave 3G cubic foot meter. I kind of wondered what that I was. That. <laughs> Since it's $13,000, I kind of like to know what it is. I think that's more than one meter. Okay. Um, those are not normally that expensive. Um, I don't think, Christine, is that for your department or maybe for Shelley? I, I think it's, um, uh, th th those are larger meters that measure a lot better down at the lower uh, resolution. And so we've been switching out our uh, combo uh, compound meters with these. Our meters and yes. So. Um, so it's a customer meter then. It would be a customer meter, not a district facility meter. No, okay. correct. Okay. All right. Well, that answer, answers that question good enough. Um, next page, thirty-nine. Again, towards the bottom, the Maynard Group phone service. I wonder why we're getting our phone service from the Maynard Group and not AT and T or something. So, anyone have any idea on that? Yeah, they. We do get our phone service through AT&T, um, but phones these days are more like computer systems. Mm -hmm. And so the Maynard Group is our, our service, um, for the technical service for the phone system, for the phone system correct. It. Okay, it's not service, right. Okay, got it, all right. Well, that's the only two I had questions on. <coughs> so I think we can move on from there. Well, I'll move approval of the warrants, right? Yes. I'll second it. Motion and second, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That's carries unanimously. Oral communication. This is time for communications to the board on items not on tonight's agenda. Can I have one? Hmm? After. After? Yeah. You tell me that. <laughs> Good evening, Becky Steinbrunner, um, resident of Aptos and customer of Pure Source Water Company. Um, thank you for the presentation. I'm glad I was able to um, hear the, your earlier presentation about your rate structuring. And um, to the end of the importance of having a clear administrative record to be able to charge those rates, I again would like to ask how the district was able to justify increasing the water demand offset rate for new <coughs> service from $18,000 per acre foot to $55,000 per acre foot. Um, it, I haven't seen a, a, like a worksheet of how that price was um, 
was arrived at. And just last week at the County Board of Supervisors meeting, there was a very angry customer of yours <laughs> at the Board of Supervisors uh, talking about how they really need to get on you and pressure you to address this issue that makes it prohibitively expensive for people who want to build a simple ADU. So I just want to let you know that's coming and that um, I also would like to know how that very large price increase was arrived and how you justify it in terms of um, water <coughs> demand um, offsets and the uh, impacts of those new, the new pumping on the aquifer. Um, second of all, I, I know that uh, the new county's Department of Public Works director has been to visit you. I was happy to see that he attended your supplemental supply committee. I think it's got a different name now, but I think um, you will also find him very refreshing to work with. I've talked with him a bit, and I think he's going to be uh, a very positive influence in our county, really moving towards some good solutions over overall. And um, Thirdly, going to uh, a bit of information that I've not been able to look over thoroughly, but through Public Records Act requests, I have a lot of questions about this Magnolia Tree Investment Group that I've seen in some of your warrants. Uh, the district has reimbursed thousands of dollars to for water demand offset, but the numbers are not quite matching up in my brief look at the, the receipts. And I see some staff notes in there that also, um, I think, really warrant your closer examination of that whole process with Magnolia Tree Investments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else wish to address us? <coughs> no one? Any director comment? I wanted to clarify because um, I was confused at the last meeting when um, um, the general manager, who's not here to defend himself, had stated that there were no grants out there for um, stormwater retrieval and um, um, projects and combined use, you know, for us to recharge. And I asked him about that, and he said he meant there were no federal grants, because I know that there are state grants, and it made it sound like there were none out there. So I just wanted to clarify that. Any other director comments? Um, another thing is that Tom and I went and did one of the coffee yeah. talk things where we, the district has set up these things that would go out into the communities and sit there for an hour or two and at various places and have customers and hopefully come and talk to us about various things. So it was not well attended, I'd say. But the people I talked to were, mm -hmm. were was valuable just to connect with a few people and have time to really talk about issues and answer all their questions is really was nice yeah. so there will be more of those I think it like once a month once a month kind of a thing and uh, we're running specific ads so yes. it'll list out the days that's good um, and I think that's it <coughs> oh I, I did want to mention that the current aqua newsletter has a nice little I was gonna bring it tonight but I forgot a nice little one-page uh, blurb about uh, stormwater in in the south in uh, Southern California and they've, they've done a study and they've ranked something like 25 of them. And you can see costs. They mentioned, for example, it, it ranges from like $50 an acre foot up to $200,000 an acre foot. And often it's for the manage, size. For managed aquifer recharge? These or? are just recharge. I mean, they just okay. recharge it per se. And uh, they mentioned that it, it uh, tends to scale with, with uh, size. So the bigger projects have lower cost. If you do a small project, you still have to do an EIR, you still have to do everything you have to do, but you're getting almost no water out of it. Right. So if you want one of these, you, you need to build it big to make it cost effective, otherwise it's gonna be horrendously expensive. But anyway, it's in the Aqua newsletter, the current one, so. That's good. I, I'll bring it in next time if anyone hasn't seen it. Regarding that, I wanted to just add a note. We talked about this. Uh, the stormwater water dem demand offset project that we had the proposal that we were considering and w there was a lot of concern about the 9,000 10,000 per acre foot and that but that what we didn't really mention was that that was over a 10 year to 20 year projected lifespan of the project so it was actually a scale up of 
over several years. So it actually is still high, but it was lower than the crazy $9,000 an acre foot. I was just so thinking about that afterwards, and I didn't mention it at the meeting, but. Yeah, well, and the, and the whole combined, um, you know, no, numerous places are being, are <laughs> I can't speak today, sorry, are um, benefiting from it. There's flood, you don't have flooding, you don't have, um, you're recharging the aquifer, you're cleaning up various um, contaminants and all that adds to the benefit and each one of those beneficiaries would be participating in it and there's a there really is a better chance of getting grant funding through the state for that kind of project so then that lowers the cost Tom oh just was going to mention that there's a in California there's a whole group of water educators that um, have an organization that they're they're in our they're touring our facilities and everything today and tomorrow, oh. and so Bruce is going to welcome them, and I'm going to be there tomorrow morning too to mm -hmm. kind of. I think it's kind of neat, you yeah. know, that they're coming to our district. Right. Okay, uh, <coughs> we go on now to the reports board planning calendar. Yes, I'm going to cover this on Ron's behalf since he's gone. He did want me to point out a, a few things. Um, in terms of June, we do have uh, another board workshop since we are going to take advantage of a fourth Tuesday of the month. On June 26, we are scheduled to have a board workshop uh, to talk about delivery models, a continuation of the workshop we had on Pure Water SoCal last month. Um, the proposed time is 5 to 8. We're shooting uh, to have the meeting go from 5 to 7.45. There, <laughs> <is a laughs> there is some material that I put on uh, the dais for each of you. It does include a handbook and a small homework assignment. So if you can make sure that you bring the book and that piece of paper back, that would be great. Um, in July, um, just wanted to point out that the board meeting is canceled for July 3rd. And then we have another board workshop, again, a follow-up. Um, on trying to get a little bit further uh, along the road for delivery models and some project assumptions for the proposed Pure Water SoCal project that feeds into uh, Sanjay and the finance plan and the rate study, as well as some of the, the grant efforts that are underway. So <coughs> there's two dates proposed. There is one um, that we could do this workshop prior to the board meeting, uh, four to six or we could do it on July 24th, which again is a fourth Friday, a fourth Tuesday, excuse me. Um, so we'd love to get some input on um, on, on selection of that date. Um, I'll go through and maybe just hit all these and if we can go back to that board workshop date. On July 19th, there is gonna be a joint MGA and GSP advisory committee, so the Mid-County Groundwater Agency and the Groundwater Sustainability Plan Advisory Committee are gonna come together and meet. This is one where staff from the different partner agencies will also be presenting on uh, projects that are underway from each agency. And then in August, we do have, um, the board meeting is canceled for August 7th, and we have one meeting scheduled for August 21st. So we come mm. back to the workshop in July? Mm -hmm. Does anyone have any problems with either of those dates? I will be hopefully teleconferencing in for the regular meeting. Uh, it will be pretty difficult to, for me to do the 4 to 6 that date, and the 24th is fine for me, but that's all. Any other comments? You all good with uh, either of the other two? I am. Joe? Um, yeah, I'm fine. Also, I, I do think, you know, I'm not just trying to push that date, but I do but think sometimes a, a couple hours before then another couple hour meeting mm -hmm. is yeah. a lot. Yeah, you know. it is. If everyone can make the second one, the 24th. I, I, I have a conflict on the 24th. I don't you know do? whether I'm needed for that meeting, but I thought I'd not. Okay. It's just a workshop. Well, let me check. No decisions. I think I had both dates work. Okay. Okay, we'll, we'll shoot for the 24th. Thank you. Best. Okay.
that would be at five. I'm putting it in my. It's uh -huh. six to eight thirty for that one. Okay. Proposed. For. Oh, okay. Does that six o'clock work? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And that would be here or in our district. At, at our learning center. Okay. All right. Special mm. projects five point two. Yeah, I don't have anything to point out specifically, but if we've missed anything, please let me know and I'll make a note of it. Any questions or comments? Anyone in the public? All right, so we move on. 5.3, organization-wide abbreviated status update. I don't have anything additional to add for conservation customer service field, but I'd be glad to answer any questions you might have. Any questions? No. Nope. Nope. Thank you. Okay, who's next? Uh, engineering. I had a lot of bullets, but um, <laughs> I think I'll re refrain from uh, speaking too much. If unless you have any questions, you can read them and. I can answer questions. Any questions of Taj? Uh, we did, I should eval uh, elaborate, we did meet with the State Division of Drinking Water yesterday to uh, discuss any of the changed uh, conditions or requirements for accepting surface water from the city. Um, so we're trying to be poised to apply for the permit amendment to be able to uh, accept water this winter. Good. And uh, again, I'll, I'll reiterate that that will be presented to our board here on July 17th, the results of that study. And then to the city in August. Yes, l late August, okay. I think eight tw August 27th. Right. Okay. 28th. Thank you. Good news. Um, O&M. Um, I just wanted to update on the O'Neill Ranch well. Um, Congratulations. We <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, yes, we did successfully lower the packer um, however it doesn't appear to be limiting the increase in ammonia at this time so hopefully it oh. may level off but right now it's looking like we may have to shut it down in a couple weeks and go to plan C um, is there a plan C um, plan C would be to low uh, seal off the lower screens entirely and try pumping from the upper screens Probably the most of the ammonia is coming from the lower screens. Um, some issues are possibly increased iron and manganese, hopefully not uh, enough to where it would overwhelm the treatment plant. Um, it would be pumping at a much lower rate um, than the whole well, so it should probably have similar impacts to nearby um, private wells because the flow rate will be less. Mm -hmm. um, and we just have to make sure we would get enough production t for the existing pump <coughs> since we have to have a minimum of about 275 to 300. Um, so that would be our, 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 our last option before we went to uh, different treatment alternatives. Is there any idea of why the same sort of thing isn't happening to Belts 24 and to Main Street, which are kind of into the same formations? and? Are fairly um, close. I don't have an answer ours. for belts 12. It's potentially because they only operate it for a month or two every year. Um, it took us our well like six months before it even started showing an increasing trend. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you have the well off for a long period of time, it takes a month. It takes a couple months for it to start ramping up. So they I may not have it. Yes. Okay. operate it enough for that. Mm -hmm. And as far as Main Street well, it has a relatively high ammonia level, but it's completely stable. Mm -hmm. So we're able to um, not have to increase our bleach dose at, mm -hmm. at that site. So it's just a stable, a stable dose. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. I assume there's some looking at ways to filter the ammonia out of the supply we get? That would be very difficult given the flow volume we're looking at. But um, There are several alternatives. Probably the m most promising or the, the most feasible would be some type of a biological treatment. We could convert our existing filter vessels into that. Mm -hmm. ah. um, so. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay. We'll keep you posted. Thank you. Okay, special projects. And I'll just point out that we are still on schedule to release the draft EIR at the end of the month. Mm -hmm. And um, we are scheduled then to have a public meeting at the end of July. And then the 45 day comment period would close in mid August. So staff has been coordinating with our EIR consultant on making that, that milestone. Um, I think Tom already hit on, uh, we are very proud that, um, that the California Water Education Committee is here in our area and by day has been working really hard on coordin coordinating that. And then I think the only third thing I I'll add right now is um, we were asked to do an interview for BC Water News. It's a, f it's a daily email uh, distribution that goes out to about 40,000 readers. And so they do this special f uh, feature column called 10 Minutes With, and they wanted to interview us about the efforts that we're doing with the innovative Sky 10 data, the sea addressing seawater intrusion, and how the community water plan and the Pure Water SoCal project fits into that. Okay, we look forward to seeing that. Um, finance? So we do have a meeting on Monday, um, <coughs> June 25th, with the Water Rates Advisory Committee, and Sanjay from Raftalis will be present, and we'll be kind of going over some of our uh, questions and, and refining that process a little bit. Um, the implementation of our new software system is underway. We expect the finance system to probably be implemented in March of next year, and it looks like utility billing is going to be April or May of next year. And um, then we will be pay making a payment of $500,000 toward our unfunded pension liability this month. And um, I've given you an update on where we stand on our OPEB unfunded liability. Right now we've got uh, $2.4 million in the trust for that, so we're about 40% funded, which is um, we're making steady progress. Kay. Any questions? No, that's great. Okay. Human resources? I'm over here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanted to uh, let the board know that we actually do have interviews scheduled tomorrow for a vacancy that we're filling. And um, for those of you who will be participating in the educational forum, it'll be a busy morning because we are doing it. Uh, we our interviews start in the morning. So if you see some some nervous faces in the lobby, uh, feel free to greet them and and uh, wish them good luck through that process. Any other questions on the report? I'm happy to answer. Anything? Thank you. And uh, do you have any general manager comments? Yeah, Ron asked me to make sure that you guys were able to view the video that he has a link in his update. And it's a three minute video. Um, it's, it's very informative. If you wouldn't mind, I, I'd like to play it for you as well as the public. Sure. I haven't seen it yet. Well, it's pretty interesting, actually. <laughs> Around the world, water is constantly moving. From 2002 to 2016, a pair of NASA satellites witnessed massive shifts in the freshwater stored on land related to water management, climate change, and natural cycles. The Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment, or GRACE mission, used precise measurements of the motions of two spacecraft in Earth's orbit to track the movement of water through the oceans, land, and atmosphere. NASA scientists combined GRACE data with satellite-based observations of precipitation and crop irrigation, climate model predictions, and other information in order to identify the causes of regional trends in freshwater storage. In this visualization, blues indicate areas with more stored freshwater than the average, and oranges and reds denote areas with less. The science team classified the major trends observed by GRACE as driven by natural variability, human activity, or climate change. For instance, the steady decrease in freshwater storage in Greenland is caused by the melting of glaciers, which drain water into the oceans. In the western United States, a long drought reduced mountain snowpack and river flows, causing heavy reliance on aquifers for crop irrigation and severe depletion of freshwater resources. Precipitation measurements together with GRACE data show how natural variations in the weather and unsustainable rates of water use conspired to deplete groundwater in California. 
In southern Africa, the Okavango Delta region experienced a huge increase in stored freshwater during the period of the GRACE mission. The science team analyzed precipitation data for the area and found that it was caused by a pronounced increase in rainfall. Between 2004 and 2012, the region saw about 15% more annual rainfall than during the previous 25 years. The rain ended a regional drought and replenished water storage in the area. In northern Saudi Arabia, GRACE detected a dramatic decrease in freshwater stored in aquifers. Images taken by NASA's Landsat program show a rapid increase in irrigated cropland, supported by water pumped from those aquifers. Most of that water is non-renewable on human timescales, but in 2014, the Saudi government ended a domestic wheat farming program, and GRACE data suggests that aquifer levels may be stabilizing. In northwest China, GRACE revealed a rapid decrease in freshwater storage without an obvious cause. Scientists knew that mountain glaciers were melting, but the meltwater did not leave the region, so they looked for another explanation. As it turns out, much of the region's surface water is redirected to agricultural areas and the desert to the south, where it evaporates, leaving the region with a net loss of water. The original GRACE satellites stopped operating in 2017, but NASA and the German Research Center for Geosciences are partnering to launch a new satellite pair, GRACE Follow-On, in late spring 2018 to continue providing data about freshwater trends around the world. Anything else? Uh, no, not from the general manager's report. Okay. Any public comments on this uh, report? Okay, seeing none, let's move on to, um, let's see, public outreach committee report. Any, uh, I can s support uh, a board if they wanted to kind of give an overview or I can provide it. Oh, I just wanted to mention um, this is this is the last meeting of the is that Adele Gardner, the public outreach uh, committee member, was going to participate because of that this is the last day that last meeting. So we had really uh, went went around the table to thank her for her service on the committee, and she actually wants to stay more involved. So she invited us to call her because we had. But she didn't apply to be on it again. No, she's going to Italy. <laughs> so she's, she's traveling. Um, but anyway, I, th uh, I think um, we discussed the, the draft EIR release in the open house, but I think that's going to be discussed at another time. Um, yeah, we, d we went over um, the schedule for the public meeting for the draft EIR. And we also talked a, a little bit about the upcoming WaterWise Academy that the district is putting on this year. Um, that'll be a three-part series of meetings where we'll be inviting um, people who are customers of the district to participate in a, in a kind of a learning and um, outreach in terms of understanding our system, our water shortage issues, touring some of the facilities, and, and hopefully uh, being better able to answer questions when they're out with, with their, their common groups in the community. Any questions, board or public? Seeing none, we move to 5-4, the, five, sorry, 5-5, five, five, the Water Resources Committee. I'll just mention that, yeah, the new Public Works Director, Matt Machado, as well as uh, Kent Edler, who's, um, also in charge of the sanitation district um, came to that meeting and it was nice to meet them face to face and share with them the different capital improvement projects that we have planned um, and then we also discussed a little bit about the applications for this committee mm -hmm. any questions none five six district council 
couple of items. Um, <coughs> the Cole hearing has been continued to December to June 29th. The judge had some questions, particularly about the the issue of whether the rates are determined at the date they're adopted, or whether you can look at facts that happened after. Specifically, looking at the fact that the Chrome 6 plant was not, in fact, constructed as anticipated at the time of the rates adoption. So this is one of the pending arguments. Um, the other, the other, the Supreme Court still hasn't decided the Great Oaks case. And the last thing that I wanted to report out was that uh, the County Council and I have been able to resolve the pending claim with respect to WDO charges at the farm. The county's going to pay the $65,000 it's owed and agreed to the terms that we had proposed about four months ago. Well done. Thank you. So hopefully we'll get that resolved. Actually, the bill was $270 more than that, but after Shelley pointed that out to me after I'd already reached an agreement, I told her I'd toss that in if it was a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> Just charge it off to a bad debt. Okay. <laughs> um, we next move to con conditional and unconditional will serve letters. There are two. Any questions on these? I have one. Okay. Is the ADU in question on the first one uh, attached? Is it? Not that I'm aware of. So will there be two meters on that one? That's correct. Oh, I should, the latest version of SB 831, mm -hmm. which is the revision to the ADU um, bill, actually has not changed anything. Um, inclusionary units are still mm -hmm. prohibited. Detached units, you can put in connection fees, everything, they could require meters, et cetera, as long as it's proportional. Okay. Hasn't been adopted yet, but that's the latest two versions have had that provision. <coughs> Any questions on these? Will, will serves? Public, Public comments? <coughs> Becky Steinbrunner, resident of Aptos, and um, again, I just want to urge the board to uh, stop accepting um, new service connections and um, until you resolve the supply storage issue. Thank you. Okay. Since both of these have met the criteria for the current WDO program, I will move approval. And I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I vote no. That passes. 6.2, adopt board resolutions relating to grant opportunities. Yes, thank you. Um, before you on this item are three uh, draft resolutions that support the district's efforts for uh, applying for or receiving grants related to the Pure Water SoCal project. The first resolution is 18-12. This is a required uh, resolution as we have been awarded the Prop 1 planning grant. Uh, for the amount of $2 million, they do require a resolution that we can enter into a funding agreement as well as authorize a designated representative um, from the district. I do want to point out, and Ron did, um, did reach out to me today, um, this is language that was uh, provided to us by the state, and I, I re realize as I read through it, I think there was a comment from a board member related to um, a portion that said to sign um, let me point out to it. Now, therefore, be it resolved and ordered that the district is hereby authorized to carry out the project. And in terms of the language here in the resolution, that project is defined as the, the scope of work that's within the grant agreement. However, based upon you know where we are with the project evaluation, that we are still you know going through uh, feasibility and not selection of a project yet, um, I, I have reached out, I did not hear back from our grant administrator if we can slightly modify that to, to reflect what's right above that, which talks about project-related activities. So I would like to suggest that we uh, modify this resolution to say that to carry out project-related activities within the grant agreement. And 
think we have two others. You want to talk about yes. those now? Yes, okay, thank you, as I took notes. Um, this, the, the next two are resolutions 1813 and 1814 to support applications for the Prop 1 implementation grant and the uh, Title 16 Water Smart uh, Recycled Water Program grant. Um, both of these just to are to express that the district uh, would like to uh, support and enter into uh, submitting a grant application to these two programs. They would be included in our grant application. If Go ahead. Anything else? Just that um, if the board um, would like to take action tonight, I just want to remind everybody that it has to be a roll call vote. Yep. Yeah. Three roll call votes. Any public comment on these uh, items? Hi, I'm Jerry Paul. I live in Santa Cruz. Um, it struck me that uh, uh, the grant applications didn't, uh, they weren't heavy on uh, w uh, river water transfer grant applications. And uh, I, when I uh, speak with board members individually and members of MGA for that matter, um, I find that there's various issues that are unresolved, and it seems to me that several of these might be resolvable using grant money, like legal issues about uh, uh, can SoCal store water and uh, would they be allowed to send it back to Santa Cruz uh, to, to actually get some of these unresolved questions off the dime. It, it, it might help the situation to apply for grant money and see if uh, anything in the way of river water transfers would uh, uh, could be um, gotten out of your way. After all, the next well to be lost might might be any time now. And uh, the, the faster we get the uh, the inner tide built, uh, for instance, and the and the legal issues resolved to 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 do that, uh, the better. It, it, uh, you don't have to do just one project. The other, the, in fact, even L'Aquifer, the biggest project of river water transfer, is uh, three times cheaper, uh, in my estimation, than pure water SoCal is, and delivers about three times more water. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner, resident of Aptos. I want to uh, concur with what Mr. Pauls has just said. Um, this grant application work seems very focused on the Pure Water SoCal project. And um, I understand having been able to attend your special meeting when this was all discussed. The reason the possibility to get a grant for this is so good is because you can call it groundwater recharge. And the pot of money from Prop 1 for uh, recycled water has already been used up, so you've got a better chance of getting money because it's groundwater recharge. So why not, if you really have not chosen your project, and I'll say it really <laughs> looks like you have, and um, the language in your draft budget looks like you really have chosen Pure Water SoCal. This only adds more um, to that public perception. You're not submitting grants for uh, stormwater recharge, um, the surface water in lieu transfers. Um, if, if you had a, a, an attractive grant package to do some improvements on the inner tie connections with um, so Santa Cruz City, that might look more appealing to them and would, it seem to me, offer a, a somewhat of a better bargaining chip for them with future um, agreements to create a regional water storage solution. So I concur with what Mr. Pauls had said and ask you to please include these projects in your uh, enormous efforts to go for this grant money. I'm encouraged hearing Mr. Dufour say that staff has just yesterday talked with Department of Water Resource about uh, starting the water transfers this winter. 
I'm very encouraged by that, and it sounds like maybe the bench test results are favorable for that without huge treatment. But still, you don't know what um, could lie ahead, and it would be good to build in some projects that could take advantage of, of those agreements and to enhance them with a pot of money, a federal pot of money, a state pot of money, just as you're doing with the, the recycled water project. Thank you. Anyone else? I'd like to correct that. We did not meet with the Department of Water Resources. We met with the State Water Resources Control Board Division of Drinking Water. Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing none, I'll pull it back. Anyone wish to make a, there are three motions proposed? I'd like to have a discussion. Yeah, okay. I think, Let's uh, discuss. Mm -hmm. So, do I understand properly that were we to apply for these grants in the EIR process um, or at some other process would uh, would cause us to to no longer want to pursue the project that there's no penalties yes so there's, so there's not a downside to it no as except for the cost of, of the preparation costs. yeah okay and then I'd just like to respond that I'm open to, you know, grant funding on other projects as well, and I'm sure the staff is. Um, and the talk about what uh, river water transfers, um, we're not a lead agency on that. We need Santa Cruz to be uh, with us on that, and I'm I'm open to that. I, if 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 they want to uh, work with us on a grant. I, and the staff thinks that it that it's um, doable. I'd, I'd support that. Yeah, I think it really clearly bears repeating that the reason why these SoCal Water District Creek Water District is going for these grant proposals is because that wa that money is available for these specific projects. And if if it were possible to do other grant proposals those would be considered also, but this is specifically targeted to a certain kind of project. And that is why this district has responded to that. And, and this is a chance to really save our customers a lot of money if we do end up going that way. And the downside is just the money we spend and the effort made to try and apply for the grants, really. That's all we would lose, so. We do have a monthly call where we come together as uh, a team and go through any ex any new grant opportunities do they apply what's the level of effort we, you know what's the cost share um, what are, what's the criteria to apply and the scoring of points just to do a cursory level of of whether or not it's something that we want to put our our efforts to I think for these two specifically I, I would want to point out the title 16 is only for recycled or reclaimed water so you know the other water supply options within the community water plan do not apply and for the prop one groundwater yes it does provide um, groundwater recharge but specifically this uh, is a grant program that is is really about replenishment and the, the seawater barrier and it's those recharge wells and the pipelines to convey that water to those that um, is making us qualify for this grant I think there's another issue here too which is that uh, this these two grants that we're looking at, both the federal and the state, are implementation grants, and that's why one's $20 million and the other is, what, 60? 50, 50, 50, 50 million, 50. right. Um, and there's just no way we could do that. I mean, we certainly, there are two transfer projects. There's the, we buy up to 300 acre feet of water from the city that they get from the North Coast, and that's, that's kind of almost a done deal now, I'd say and there really isn't much implementation in that. But the other project, we don't, I mean, I've heard so much speculation as to how much the city would want for that project or need for that project. And until you have something defined, uh, you can't ask for money. Uh, right. You can't ask for $100 million just because you want it. Uh, uh, you'd have to have a project defined and give them the specs and show them what the cost is gonna be and why it's that. Um, if we were to ask for any kind of transfer grant right now, it would be a feasibility investigation kind of a grant and and that's much smaller um, you know, maybe a million dollars or so and 
again, you kind of have to show them that you need that money to actually get into it. Uh, but so, uh, you know, we're ca comparing apples and oranges here. Uh, you know, we, we can't really go the place that I think some of you would like us to go because they're different. One's an apple and one's an orange, and you know, we can only do what we can with what we've got. So. Well, the proposition defines specifically what the funding is for and how much funding is for each item. And there, you know, there's funding for stormwater re um, capture and recharge that's coming up. It's not necessarily there right now, but there is funding coming up. But there isn't something for just in case we want to do this and we get some money. It's like asking for funding to do some maintenance. And, um, maintenance that you've deferred for years and now it's an emergency they won't give you that it's just how they define it so if and when the city who is would be the leader of this project defines exactly what it is and what its cost is and how it's composed and so forth you know then we could talk about doing a, a grant for that but uh, until that happens um, we don't know what it is so. anyway so I would like to move approval of the three resolutions and with the corrections that the addition that Melanie added to the first one to yes. the first one mm -hmm. what what if they won't accept that though I mean I've had issues with the state with resolutions that they didn't accept our changed wording when I got grants at the county and then I had to come back like a month later and have it with like three words changed could it, if it that's could, needed I'd be good with the language that's there if they don't accept it. We're just right. trying to clarify. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How about that? The motion is that, if possible, to use that wording. Okay. If it's okay with the state, otherwise, use what they need. Okay. Yeah. okay. And Melanie, just to clarify, um, you were adding uh, and carry out the agreement. Was that? No, it was. Project and to carry related out project the project-related project activities, activities within the grant agreement. Project-related activities within the grant agreement. Thank you. I would check with their attorneys before I'm um, finalizing okay. it. But the motion gives you the flexibility if we. Thank you. Know. Okay, we have a motion. Did we get a second? I'll, I'll second it. Uh, okay. Carla. Oh, she it. already did. So, uh, roll call vote. Um, Director Lather. Yes. Director LaHue. Yes. Director Jaffe. Yes. Director Christensen. Yes. And President Daniels. Yes. Okay, we move on to 6.3. Um, I think we have to do them all separately, so oh, uh, am I correct I in that? I don't think we do. No, they can put them all at one. Okay. Well, there's okay. no differences. Okay, thank you. Okay. okay. 6.3, approve various scopes of work for professional consulting services. Yes, thank you. This is another item I'd like to present to the board. This is, um, in summary, this is Another presentation of the scope of work that we have identified for the Pure Water SoCal project, as well as some consultants that work on our overall community water plan. Um, we have, you know, this is year four of us evaluating the Pure Water SoCal project, so we do have quite a few uh, consultants that we've gone through uh, the selection process and have active contracts with and each year right around the time that we approve the budget we come forward with uh, I I fiscal year uh, scopes of work for what we have what we have identified as work that we uh, will be carrying out um, within the next year so as you know there was an amount of money budgeted for pure water socal within the the fiscal year budget that was just approved last year and this in detail then outlines uh, the scope of work and the contracts that we would like to extend um, going forward. As you can see on page two of this memo item, or actually page 91 of the packet, um, most of the work still is to support the evaluation of the Pure Water SoCal project in terms of environmental review, technical support, um, items related to the Prop 1 planning grant activities. We do have about seven scopes of works or mini projects within that planning grant that would include some further evaluation and analysis on pipeline and preliminary design work on pipelines, um, the pilot well to uh, drill and test the 
uh, recharge capacity in the Cabrillo College Drive area. We also have um, some uh, scopes of work in there to help support operational agreements and discussions with uh, the city of Santa Cruz as we go forward with um, you know, solidifying uh, secondary effluent that we are receiving from them that would be used as source water for the Pure Water Soquel project. We also have efforts related to um, funding and grant assistance. So as we mentioned in the last board item, we do have two consultants that we work primarily and solely focused on funding, financial, and grant opportunities. And then we have some consultants in there that um, do technical uh, technical advisement, technical studies. We do have one for Corolla engineers that will be de to develop a source control study. Right now, the city of Santa Cruz's source control program is designed based upon what can they discharge legally out to the Monterey Bay. This is very different in terms of this is a source water that would be water that would go into the ground. So we do have uh, an effort that we've identified just to ensure, you know, th are there are there sources out there within our community that we may want to set some additional provisions on. And so that would be what this study would do. Um, we do have Data Instincts on board again. They provide education and outreach support and advisement uh, for all of the water supply options and all the components related to the community water plan. And then we have, of course, um, you know, Brown and Caldwell, um, who will be doing most of the, m much of the technical work related to some of the Prop 1 grant activities, uh, technical work to support the EIR as we close the uh, comment period. That will be when we go back to review all the comments, uh, provide additional information related to technical support or technical work that may need to be done. Um, and so that is included. And then, of course, we have identified, really, there is uh, a much needed, much needed effort to lay out a comprehensive schedule, do cost estimates. I think that was very uh, apparent in the workshop today with, with Sanjay and a 20-year finance plan and uh, you know the, the five-year rate study, we really want to try and take this project or projects and get them to be defined better so that we can do cost estimates and lay that out. So the work that's identified here is what we feel we can comfortably uh, do in the next year, one, to support all of the activities that we have already put in the grant agreement with the state. Two, to keep us on schedule with the board's uh, intent of this project, you know, coming online in 2022, 2023. And then three, really to position us that we're not getting too far ahead of where we need to be um, with this project since it's still underway with, with CEQA, we're doing preliminary design. This is not, this is efforts that's not getting too far ahead before the board does an approval of, of the project to go into construction. And, you know, really maximizing on the amount of money that we are getting from the grant. So, you know, all of this effort, once we um, anticipate and, and roll in the, the grant reimbursement is about um, $600,000. And uh, I can answer any other questions. Any board questions? So it, does the grant specify which of these tasks will be uh, supported by the grant versus which won't? Because there's a this is all a hodgepodge of yes um, for the grant it gets a little bit more complex or I should say way more complex first of all the prop one grant goes back to November of 2014 and so we have you know that's really great from from the district standpoint because we can count that as match the prop one planning grant is a 50 50 match so we have money that we are using already as match and then we've identified th some of this work that would be solely funded as a grant reimbursable. So things specifically related to the environmental review, technical support, property land support, um, let me see, the water quality support, public outreach, that is all part of uh, what the grant will cover. Funding assistance and applying for grants they do not cover. Anyone in the public has any comments on that?
Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner, resident of Aptos. I'm, I'm curious about this uh, contract with Tom Burns, the former Santa Cruz County Planning Director. And um, I see on page uh, 127 of the packet, I see his proposal. So he's already been working uh, with this, and, I, and I've seen payments to him in the warrants in your board packets. What I don't understand is why you need him. I'd like to um, have a little bit of discussion about um, why he would be brought in and exactly how he would be helpful for this and um, why it's being targeted for um, the, the pure water project only and not also for any issues regarding the, say, the stormwater recharge for the golf course. Um, other projects that you also claim the district is is doing for groundwater recharge. Thank you. Yes, Tom um, Tom Burns um, has a lot of knowledge and experience with land use and CEQA um, due to his past uh, experience and profession as a, a planner. So we really leverage and utilize that to help support the district. We are a very small staff. We don't have any environmental planners on our staff, nor have we thought to add that. We, we talked about it, but we just don't really have that kind of need. So on occasion, Taj has used um, efforts from Tom to help on other issues related to the CIP. Um, we are using him on the Pure Water SoCal project. Specifically right now, we are in a different place. Again, as we've mentioned before, with these proposed projects being evaluated, we're currently underway with CEQA. We currently are doing some negotiations and discussions on property sites for a pilot well. And so that's really where uh, we've had Tom help a lot on. Again, I think as uh, Director Jaffe asked, you know, wha what's what's grant reimbursable or not. Um, the, the state really does feel that efforts related to property acquisition, land lease options, those are very important because those are kind of what make a project work. And so they're really complex issues. We, we work with Bob, but on a staff level, we just don't have that experience. And, and even I work with Tom. We, I brought him, Ron and I have met just recently to go over a lot of property related issues and his expertise and background has been very helpful. Okay. So, any questions or comments about this whole thing? Um, I'd like to make a motion. Well, there any? Once it's uh, done, should, yeah. Yeah, discussion. So, it's directed towards the staff. So, we're in this situation again with an EIR. We're things hinge upon what the EIR um, outcome is. So is the staff, when, when um, all these are not to exceeds, is the staff, I know there's competing factors here. There's the, the cost savings, if we were to go with the project, of being, being able to do it sooner rather than later, and then there's the the fact that there's a risk involved in that we don't have a certified EIR we don't know what the outcome is going to be there so how is the staff handling that is is, is what I want to know it, are are you getting to the point we going to the point where we're saying we should we need to do this now because of these reasons and we can put off doing these things until after the EIR outcome is known. Is, is that being, is that filter being applied? That filter is being applied. Um, and as you notice, most of the things that are in here are, are tasks and activities that can be done concurrently with CEQA. And it's not that CEQA is a precursor. I will point out um, with, with these consultants, um, many of them as we come forward each year, we, we do a not to exceed we monitor and we work with the consultants each month on what the activities are and very rarely if ever do we have to come back because we have we've gone over the budgeted amount in fact you know as you can see on these the only one where we've actually had to come back because we've we've exceeded an original scope 
was, was with the environmental consultant because we went out for two scoping periods, we added additional sites, uh, that, that then required additional level of effort on their part. The one thing where we um, are going ahead on something that would normally have been covered if we had a certified EIR is the pilot well. If we had completed the EIR and that was certified, we could use that document as the environmental review for, for, for putting that well in. Because we, are, we do not have that document, we need to have ESA do an initial study and a mitigated NEGDEC. This is a, a study project, a research to gather data. So that is a smaller level of effort that we have to do right now that we would not have had to have done if we had a certified EIR. And staff's determined that waiting for a certified EIR has repercussions that are um, negative to the point that, that, that we don't wait. I think the pros of, of getting the information from the, the pilot well are, high, are greater than the, n the negative of waiting. And I think there's another point, too, that uh, this has multiple uses. But if we decided to go with this transfer project, they wouldn't be able to give us the water all year long, probably. They'd give us a whole chunk in the, in the wintertime, and we couldn't just drink it all, so we'd have to put it in a recharge well, so we would already have, first of all, investigated one, in fact, have one. So that's something we'll have to, almost any source we get, we're right. probably going to have to do some recharge. So this is a way that we can get started on that, because it's, multiple uses. Or it would allow us to take some water right. that we couldn't take otherwise. Right. right. And you notice it's just, we're not buying the, the site, I think. We're, we're, we're actually just leasing, leasing. it. That's and correct. Until we decide what we're doing, so. Yeah, yeah and the information will help support, um, I, I think, the efforts related to the MGA. This is a specific region where we don't have a lot of data for. We've worked with hydrometrics in terms of, of the three pilot uh, locations three locations we've identified for the recharge well, which would be the best to do a pilot study at. They have a lot of information at Monterey. They have some information related to Willowbrook because of tannery. Yeah. Um, but this is an area that um, would provide information that we could share um, and, and also does support. So um, part of that effort is the geochem analysis. So when Brown and Caldwell did that study for us two years ago, we used well cuttings that were like, based upon monitoring wells, the production wells that were drilled. This would be actually looking at the soil there at the recharge well to better understand and characterize what, what we would need to do for post-treatment. Any other discussion? Think It'll also help the board when they do consider the EIR and or a project, whether um, the additional sites for the recharge wells are needed and whether this one well would be able to sustain the recharge. That's so true. the capacity to recharge is also a piece of information that would help you when approving a project if that's a piece of information you might need. As you were saying. Okay, <laughs> for, um, I'm waiting for a, a decision on whether I should abstain on two of these. So I'd like to make a motion to, um, for one, two, Whoa. let's see, Eight. to approve them. When you get to it, I want to uh, make a motion to um, follow one, two, let's see. Four, five, seven, and eight to approve those. You separately. want to do those separately? Okay. One, two, so five, six. Okay. Yep. So I'll second those. Okay. Let Let's me just see, see what we were approving here. All but Carollo and Brown and Caldwell. Well, if it's one, two, five, you, there's also Tom Burns got left out of there. No, well, I said four. She said four, four and five. Okay. One, two, four, one, five. One, two, four, 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 five. Seven and eight. Seven okay. and eight. Okay. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. Okay. All in fa favor? Yeah. Uh, no, no roll call vote. Uh, All in favor? Aye. Aye. A lot of money, but yes. <laughs> I think that's unanimous. And All right. That's I'll done. make the motion for items three and six. 
I will second that. Three and six. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And I'm one abstention. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I abstain. Okay. But I mean, a lot of this is covered by grant funds. Yeah, but it's still, it's, it's, it's still still a lot of money that we're asking yes. our customers to pay. I know. But what are the alternatives? That's the point. We're really trying to take care of the long run. And in the and for for some of the discussion we've heard before, <coughs> if the city ever decides to do their transfer back and forth thing, I mean this is going to look simple in comparison because there, this is something we're adding on to our existing system. It's separate, and there you're going into an existing running system and you know, increasing the capacity of this and changing that and put replacing this giant pipe with that giant pipe. And so this is this is trivial compared to. I think what the city is probably going to end up doing. It and also, I think it's appropriate to recall how much at the same stage of uh, research and development on the desal project, the joint project with uh, Santa Cruz, we had a lot more invested in it at that point. Because, okay. yeah, they didn't have the grant funding, yeah. yeah. Okay, 6.4, the Granite Way well site improvements. As most of you have been following, uh, this has been a, a long process for the for us, for staff. Um, it's it's our third well of five for the well master plan. Uh, we already did the Polo Grounds Iron and Manganese treatment plant, and then we did O'Neill, and this is the Granite Way well that is uh, located at the intersection of Trout Gulch and Cathedral Drive. Um, the well has already been drilled and developed. The raw water main that goes uh, across the new Aptos village towards the uh, T. Hopkins treatment plant is already in place. And so the last part of the project is to bring um, electricity there and install um, the telemetry and final piping to activate that well. And so these are the plans to do that, build a fence around the site. and. Um, we will be calling for bids and bringing them back to you for consideration. I just wanted to mention, just for people that forget, this was replacing another well that went we stopped using right. in the same area. Uh, that's right. Um, and also, it is, of course, part of the master well master plan is to move pumping further from the ocean. So not necessarily increasing pumping, but redistributing pumping. And the ER for this was done in the well master plan, which was years ago. That's correct. But to me, the big, the key thing is it's replacing another well. Yeah, right. Yeah. Not to use more water. Maybe to use it more intelligently. Redistributing yeah. pumping. It's more inland than one of the wells. Okay. Any questions? Any public questions and comments? Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner, resident of Aptos, and I go by this site every day. And I've been watching it for a long time. So um, I'm happy to see it moving forward. What I still want to know is, has the district done the chemical testing for the panel of contaminants, as was recommended by now retired Santa Cruz County Environmental Health Hazardous Material Specialist, Mr. Tim Fillmore, that you do with this new water source because nearby and upstream from your well is a contamination site from the um, underground storage tank that Aptos Village developers and their subcontractors removed illegally. And the real site of the tank has not been remediated. And there is some work in the process trying to get that cleaned up. But the in my opinion, the plume is still moving toward your well. Now I know that from Public Work, Public Records Act request material, your, your district did do some t chemical testing, but all of the panel of contaminants had to do with the nearby dry cleaning business that used to be there. None of the contaminants, and I've checked the list of what was tested for and what was found in the Aptos Village project site, and none of the contaminants, such as gasoline-related organics, xylene, toluene, a whole host of other things related to fuel, were not tested for when the district tested for the dry cleaning contaminants. 
I think that your customers want to know that these tests have been done because I think you will see in the near future a lot of talk about the contamination that most likely remains at that site with a high groundwater table and an improperly closed case closure. I also, in um, 2015, I appealed the changes to, significant changes to the Aptos Village project, and one of those changes was the relocation of this well. And at the time, I, there was no information brought to address my concerns, but I do have communication from Mr. Dufour about the structure that was going to be put at the site, and I'm not seeing any structure at this site. So um, I want to know, is there going to be a structure at the site? I see there will be uh, fencing, and I would also like to see the landscape plan because of the visibility issues and the um, aesthetics of that area. I also want to know if there is no um, structure, what will the noise levels be? And um, I, I just finally want to say I don't understand why the well was not moved further inland to the quail run site you. if your plan is to move things more inland. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Any discussion? <laughs> well, uh, what is the update on the, the diesel contamination? contamination or potential diesel contamination? Um, well, we're going to, the state, when in order to put this well online, the state is going to require a full, um, will comply with their required water quality testing results. What, what depth does the well come from? Well, I know the seal is, r is about 380 feet down, so there's a uh, annular seal that would block off any of that. And there is not a high water table, at least in, in the groundwater well. I think it's at least 110 feet down for our static water level in the area. Um, and I think the well is maybe six, six, 650, 650 feet deep. And there are aquitards between the surface and, the, and yes. the where it's being pumped? And okay. Many layers of clay. That's okay. blanked out. You can't that down there. Did, does the state require you to um, do any monthly testing and sampling reporting or is it annual once you get a well, a new well? I'll let Christine address that. They do require us to do a drinking water source assessment plan which identifies any sources of contaminants in the vicinity mm -hmm. um, and that is done every five years? Or every Ten, well, it's only required one time, but it's recommended updated. to be updated every 10. 10 years, okay. Um, and as far as the monitoring requirements for an initial well, it depends on what the compound is. Um, some compounds, it's just every three years. Um, things like organics and pesticides are, uh, you need to do four quarters, but most most are not four quarters. But the inorganics are, are just um, the normal frequency. And petrochemicals are organics, right? Or mm -hmm. Yeah. So that would be quarterly. Um, yes, I think the VOCs would be quarterly for a year. Mm -hmm. And I do believe we already pulled samples from that well. We did. Yeah. 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 So you're, you're monitoring it on a regular basis. They don't move that fast. So. Um, well, we aren't now. There was no pump. When we did the well, development, we pulled our initial yet. set of our, our, our initial monitoring and there's nothing unusual. And once you start pumping, then it's quarterly for a year. Uh, yes. Thank you for taking care to make sure that water is safe for our users. That's what she does. Okay. All right. I will move approval of both motions. I'll second. Roll call, please. Director Lather. Yes. Director LeHue. Yes. Director Jaffe? Yes. Director Christensen? Yes. And President Daniels? Yes. We go to item 6.5, Service Area 3 to 4 Intertie Project. This is another project that is trying to bolster our reliability for our distribution system. Um, we currently have one pipeline serving um, La Selva Beach and Canyon del Sol. 
and uh, there's a map uh, in the board packet that shows where this would be. Uh, it's basically at the end of Sumner Avenue, um, going through some uh, agricultural land and into Los Barrancos, where we have a distribu distribution mains. Uh, the current uh, pipeline is on San Andreas Road, and the current sources in La Selva Beach are, are not actively being used. So we would like to install this to provide a redundancy to those residences and service connections. There, it, the project does include a pressure reducing station because the pressures in, in Seascape are higher than those in La Selva Beach. And so that is part of it. Uh, it's a unique project. We do have to uh, directionally drill underneath some trees um, on the southern end of the project. Um, and yeah. it, it, because it's agricultural, actively agricultural land, we have to uh, put the pipe in deeper than normal. Mm. Uh, so there's more cover when they do the ripping of the crops. How close to the railroad tracks will that be? This is not within the railroad right of way. This is actually on the parcel Big adjacent way. to the railroad. And how deep are you directionally drilling? Um, it's pretty deep. It's, yeah, maybe 40 feet or so. And it's HDD, so it's just straight. It's, it's not auger guided or. Uh, it's, yes, correct. It's not horizontally, it doesn't deviate horizontally. Mm -hmm. There's a map in there that shows you the uh, the depths of it. Uh, yeah. Well, yes. I'd like to make motions one and two. I'll second. Roll call, please. Director Lather. Yes. Oh wait. Oh wait, 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 wait. Public. 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 Yeah. Public. Oh, public. Oh, forgot that. Thank you. Well, uh, I was ready to vote. <laughs> <laughs> Getting late. <laughs> Thank you again for the opportunity to speak. I'm still Jerry Paul. Um, Glad you I've been changed. thinking ahead. <laughs> Excuse me, I didn't hear that. I said glad you haven't changed. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been thinking ahead to the lovely moment when all these water source efforts actually result in the filling up of our aquifers, which gives us an opportunity to use that new infrastructure to serve a wider area and or put an uh, 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 injection fence to keep uh, sea level rise from uh, coming inland. Um, and so it, it spurs me to ask, A, what's the capacity of that pipeline? That, I guess that's the main thing. Uh, and and does it, w will it have the potential of moving water to such a fence, not just for the customers, but for these extra purposes, of moving it to the fence, or say maybe there's a need in Watsonville or Pajaro Valley that might arise once our aquifers have been recharged. Thanks for the question, uh, taking the question. Well, it's a 12 inch pipe. And of course, simply by putting it in, we double capacity right there because we now have two 12 inch pipes. I don't know how many gallons. Yeah, I don't have that off the top of my head. But, but you know, 12 adequate. Inch pipe could a lot of water could flow through yeah. like that. Mm. And it's making it safer for all the people in that eastern, right. southern part of the district. Yeah, it's, it's a one-way pipe. It wouldn't be able to bring water up from Pajaro or anything. It would be going down that way, but right. um, probably more than adequate to cover anything that we would have left over in that area to, we do not have any real sources other than uh, cells and Altivo that are not really, um, not really actively sources. being used at this time. Um, but thank you for the comment. But that does bring up an, an, a worthwhile comment about what we've been doing. I mean, we have these four areas we talk about in the district, and previously they were kind of semi-independent. In fact, you'd have to guarantee there was spare wells in each of the re regions because, you know, what if one well were to go out and you'd need a spare in that region but now we've got the whole district, pretty much in particular with this, we'll now have the whole district interconnected. So, you know, if you need to take water from Santa Cruz and take it to La Selva, we'll be able to do that very easily. And uh, that's kind of good stuff. Yeah. The redistribution. A lot of flexibility on how to operate the system. Right. The redistribution of pumping helps with that. Yep. Yep. In fact, we may intensify pumping in, in, in the area of recharge yep. and, and send it down here to, to rest these wells. 
And one of the reasons we're doing this is that both of the wells that used to be in Area 4, <coughs> La Silva, are both not used anymore, one because of nitrates and the other because of chrome 6. So uh, it's particularly important to have a, a, a spare because if that one path were to go out, La Silva would have no water at all. That's right. So anyway, so much for that. And we have a motion and a second. Roll call, please. And a roll call vote. Uh, <laughs> Director Lather. Yes. Director LeHue? Yes. Director Jaffe? Yes. Director Christensen? Yes. And President Daniels? Yes. And that's for both motion, both resolutions. Yes, yes. thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Six six. Select yes. and appoint public members. I just have a couple points to um, mention on item 6.6. .6. This is to select and appoint the public members to the three standing committees that the district has. Currently, we have three standing committees. Um, we have the Water Resource Management and Infrastructure Committee, the Public Out Career the Public Outreach Committee and then the Finance Committee. These were all created in the spring of 2016 and currently they have had one public member up until this point. Um, when uh, we approached 2018, the board had interest in expanding uh, public members and so we launched uh, an application process in the month of April and received 21 applications, um, which I think is a great sentiment to uh, the the community engagement we have on our, on our water issues. Um, in fact, I think all 21 applied for the Water Resource and Infrastructure Committee. Um, the 21 applications were vetted by a committee um, that included staff as well as Director Jaffe and Director Christensen. And they, um, at, at the selection committee, we recognized that we had a lot of uh, customers who ha um, showed a lot of interest, showed a lot of desire, and we started to question whether or not we wanted to, to keep the, the number of two public members, which was originally identified when we went out in April. So on the second page of this staff memo, or page 172 of the packet, uh, we are proposing four customers for the Public Outreach Committee, four customers for the Water Resource Management and Infrastructure Committee, and two for the Finance and Administrative Services Committee. And I think um, I was part of the staff, and I know uh, Director Jaffe and Christensen are, are here if you guys have questions. I just was impressed with some of the qualifications. Unbelievable. And, 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 yeah. and some of the knowledge base. I mean, we're I think we're all going to benefit. Good stuff. Yeah, so oh, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say the challenge was because there are so many applicants, and especially the Water Resources Management Infrastructure Committee had a high number of applicants. So the problem was how much to expand the committees without making them too unwieldy. And I think we came up with a good compromise. Uh, mm. And uh, uh, well, you can have some other things to say. But uh, no, go ahead. I was going to say that w part of the, the discussion centered on uh, the, the Water Academy and perhaps uh, because a lot of these people, uh, some of them have been, like John Dickinson, for example, has served on committees before, so he's kind of familiar with the, how the SoCal Water District works and also with some of our uh, supplemental supply issues, but a lot of these people would probably enjoy and benefit from attending the Water Academy, and then we wanted to extend that to the other applicants to the committees. Also, we discussed that, but th those would be maybe the first two groups to to pilot our, the, the academy mm -hmm. and then before we expanded it outward. So anyway, that's all I have to say about that. Yeah, yeah just um, also that uh, Ryan from Finance, and maybe Leslie, although she just arrived recently from a trip. So as Ryan uh, also had input into the Finance and Administrative Services Committee. But it, yeah, overwhelming <coughs> response, very qualified. And I'm curious if the other directors think that, you know, going with four, four, and two, it would, would work. In my opinion, you've done good. Yeah. I, I think it'll be fine. Mm -hmm. yeah. Break that. I mean, I, it's kind of like how do you cut some of these people? It was cut? difficult because <laughs> yeah. there's some there's some great qualifications. So right. I think it'll make it. Yeah, and and 
you know, we tried to keep it diverse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tried to balance people who, you know, were with different backgrounds, different areas of the district. I just think the more people that understand what we're dealing with, um, the more they can be out in the community and explaining things, and we get that information out there. Mm -hmm. yep. Uh, in fact, one of the things I was mentioning at our Water Resource Committee meeting we had last is these are public meetings, so we can certainly encourage the people who didn't get selected to come to the meetings anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Members of the public can come. They can have comments about things. And, you know, Maybe next go-around, someone will drop out, and they'll get on, and it'll and be good. And they'll know what's going on. They'll know what's going mm -hmm. on, exactly. It's definitely good to have diverse outlooks because sometimes there's other ways of looking at things that none of us have thought about. Mm -hmm. It's hard to imagine, but it's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to have. Well, any public comment on this? Seeing none. Right. Well, I'll move approval of, of the whole slate. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? One of the things I would like to do, I would like to ask so that we in the Water Resources Committee can get a running start, because our next meeting is in August, middle August. I would like to put together a meeting of that group so we can talk about things like aquifers and aquifer layers and formations and pipes and pumps and tanks so all of us can start at the same basis so that we all kind of know what we're going about, what, what we're dealing with. So, can, can um, you see about setting up a, a uh, meeting? Like a, uh, like, a, like a kickoff meeting? A kickoff and meeting. would that kickoff meeting be at the next meeting, or you want to do that prior? Before okay. the next okay. meeting, so that we can actually do work at the next scheduled meeting. Okay. Thank you. And, in fact, if anyone else wants to come, too, because we'll talk about stuff that maybe other committee members might mm -hmm. be interested in. I think it's important for all the committees to have a feel for the whole Mm -hmm. the kind of nuts and bolts yeah, what our work. supply is what our demand is what our problem is, is. I mean, they, a lot of them get it but. what's climate change and how's that figure in and all those things what we've already looked at so we don't start yes, all from yes. scratch right we may be able to do and this was i think um, something that carla had talked about was have the committee members go through the waterwise academy um, yes. Due to the the size of it, we talked about doing maybe a focused one for committee members, and and we can do that with the you know it's tr maybe try it out as a learning launch mm -hmm. with the um, that committee itself, mm -hmm. um, and I think we can maybe do that for each of the committees, especially because they have four new members, and then based upon kind of the the discussions with the selection committee, we are asking the other applicants who ha uh, were not selected on the committee. To um, to be engaged and apply for our WaterWise Academy. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to like to add on that that even the finance uh, the finance committee members would benefit from having a wider understanding of the whole all the water issues. In fact, both of the people that were subsequently chosen for the committee expressed interest in being in a, on other committees. So all of the there is a wide overlap in the places that the the community members were interested. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think we're done with that one now. Mm -hmm. 6.7, update on advanced metering infrastructure. Mm. Is there a presentation? Or? No, just that. Do you need to switch to that, or you want that? Yeah. Okay. Mm. So good evening. We saved the most exciting thing for the end of the meeting. Um, well, I want to make a couple, a couple introductions here tonight. We have um, staff members from Master Meter, who's our current metering system. 
And um, we have Tyson Withrow here to my right. Tyson is the software trainer and tech support person. He's here from Texas. We um, did have some training today for the Harmony software upgrade that we needed to make to make the switch to the hybrid AMR, AMI meters, and so that went very well. We also have Ed Amelung here. Ed's the regional sales manager with Master Meter, and he's been uh, really our sales support person for, I think, about 10 years. So he was with us through the first AMR deployment. And then I also have Chris Friels here tonight, the district's customer service supervisor, <laughs> if there's any questions um, internally about the process that we're, we're looking at doing. Um, I'm going to have Tyson give a demo tonight of the features of the Harmony software and the customer um, app and portal um, that's called My Water Advisor. And uh, first, I want to uh, just give a little background on the memo. So the memo just uh, goes over the nature and the scope of the challenges that we're currently facing with our drive-by automated meter reading system. Um, where the, uh, the batteries um, are starting to fail in those devices. And so we're having to um, take a quicker look than we had originally intended at upgrading our metering infrastructure. Instead of being like four years out from now, we're, we're instead having to take a close look at that now. And some of the options that um, we've already considered which would be keeping the AMR system as is and just continuing to replace those registers or looking at an upgrade to AMI. And that's what the board is, has indicated um, you're interested in. And so um, what we've identified within the master meter suite of products is this hybrid option where we can originally initially put um, replacement registers in and read them in AMR drive-by mode. And then when we feel comfortable with making an upgrade to automated metering infrastructure, we can install the, inf the infrastructure that goes with that. So the um, collector stations or base stations and um, repeaters is needed to carry a signal to the collector stations. And we don't have to do the entire system. We can do it area by area. We're going to do it area by area to make sure that um, you know the the board satisfied with it. We're satisfied with it. We want to make sure that we don't have any interference issues with our SCADA equipment or our radio communications. Um, this is a licensed product, unlike the current AMR system, and so there's a lot more. Um, things that have to be considered it's it's a more difficult process um, so there's a lot of information in the memo some of the attachments or the product specs um, that we're looking at from the the endpoints or the registers to the software to the the infrastructure so the base stations and the repeaters um, I wasn't planning on on going over that in too much detail but if there's questions um, we can certainly come back to that, and Ed is, um, you know, very familiar with the product and can answer those. Um, I did want to, I guess, seek out the board's um, direction tonight on some of the items that um, we're proposing to do next. Uh, the next step, as we see it, is to um, really go back now that the the. Uh, radio transmission prop study is done, we can start to finalize our costs. What's it going to cost us to do a full upgrade? Um, everything from uh, the registers, uh, we do need to purchase for the larger meters, an uh, inch and a half and up. We are planning on, on uh, purchasing new meters and registers for those services because those meters do not have the same 20-year warranty as the 94% that um, that serve single family homes, the five eight inch meters. And so we're looking at replacing those and kind of uh, knocking out some of the, the water meter testing requirements that we also have coming up and, and getting out ahead of that. Um, let's see, I wanted to get some feedback too. We're planning on coming back to the board at the next meeting, not only with that cost information, but an analysis of how much water we think a full deployment of AMI could save and to propose that as an offset generating project 
uh, to be funded with development fees. And I think that's uh, pretty much it. Um, running the, uh, the meters that we do get installed um, in a, a pilot test for the next two or three months in the drive-by mode, and then um, uh, beginning to put the first base station and, and what, however many repeaters we need for that um, in place after that point if we're satisfied with the results of the pilot and the board satisfied. So that's kind of the uh, the things that I'm looking for direction on. But um, I think what we'll do next, if that's okay, is to go ahead and have Tyson give a demo of the software and the My Water Advisor um, portal and app, and then circle back to a discussion. Um, does that work? I just have a question. You mentioned that for some reason, being a licensed product makes it more complicated I don't understand it's um, Federal Communications Commission it's a licensed frequency okay. yeah frequency. and so they have um, gone ahead and applied for that licensing on our behalf okay. and we have that but even though we have a frequency in which we're designated to run this system we still have to make sure that we don't interfere with right. um, SCADA operations and that our our frequency doesn't get stepped on as well. So there's some work that needs to be done there. Is the uh, radio system different than we have now? The way I understand it works now is every few seconds, the device wakes up and sends the information to hopefully the passing by truck. Yes, every 11 seconds, right. the, meter, the registers send out a signal. Yeah, the mobile Allegro mobile system that we're looking at is very different. It goes into a sleep mode mm -hmm. until the receiver um, is uh, in the vehicle, in the service vehicle, is within about a mile of that area. Then that starts sending out a signal to these registers to wake up. And so there's a lot less energy consumption going on. And a lot, a lot less electromagnetic radiation. Exactly. Going on. Correct. But as far as following and being able to pick up a leak at some time during the month, it won't do that? It will not do that as we read it um, in drive-by mode. But when they go to AMI mode. Right. Yeah. Then you'd have, inter mm -hmm. and then I don't know if it would be continuous or every so many seconds at that point. Um, no. When we go to full AMI mode, this is my understanding, is that um, the the register is collecting reads basically every hour, and it's sending those reads to a collector station twice a day, so every 12 hours. And when it, uh, uh, it has to detect 24 hour continuous usage to be a leak. And so it's a 24 hour plus maybe another hour lag period before you would be notified of a leak with this AMI system. Is that so it's something not instantaneous but it's, it's within a 24 hour period. Is that something that's programmable or is it something that's hardwired? If I may, can I bring yep. these up to kind of show you the oh. sure. difference of the product? I have the full meter with the register and then I have just the register itself that will go on our current meters or even our competitor's meter and mm -hmm. it is programmable. Um, if, I, if I may? Yeah, go ahead. If you go to the podium, podium, that'd be great. Thanks. The, the big difference between what we current or you currently have is our third generation product, the unlicensed one, is like Shelly was saying, is a mobile product only. In other words, you drive by once a month, whatever. The problem with that is, let's say you read it today and tomorrow somebody had a leak, you're not going to know for 30 days with the current product that's a hybrid, it's either mobile or fixed, you set up a tower. In the fixed mode, if there's a leak or a magnetic tamper or counterclockwise, the meter itself is sending out a blip like every five minutes. So there, you're gonna know within five minutes that there's a leak, that that ran for 24 hours and you're gonna see it back at the office that there's a leak instead of waiting 30 days. So that helps with conservation. Does that make sense? So if there's a leak, it sends out more frequently? Yes. Okay. Yes, any, any type of alarm. Yeah, that's great. 
Well, they were ta you were talking about 24-hour, any, any situation where it's 24-hour. Yes, the 24-hour the is if there's a leak, we don't want it to run. If somebody's filling up their pool or, or doing something, landscape or whatever, we want to make sure that runs long enough to make it look like, you know, there's a, probably a leak there if it's a 24-hour period. Now, if there's no usage on that meter for three hours, it turns itself off. It turns the leak off. So. And is that all programmable? Yes. As well? Yes, so that, that's, if, if, that if comes if with the product automatically. But so, but if, if our staff decided they wanted, instead of 24 hours, to do 18 hours or, or 12 hours? It is programmable, yes, sir. Okay. Right, and when we talk about automated uh, meter infrastructure, so using radio frequencies to transmit, mm -hmm. we consistently have people concerned about uh, the dangers of, of, uh, of transmitting radio frequencies. Mm -hmm. are, are you qualified to talk about that? or are you uh, To the point where obviously our product goes to the FCC and we cannot exceed. We, there, there have been competitors of ours that have taken their product bumped it up a little bit, they got it, tested it, it exceeded the FCC capability on either the tower or the meter itself, that um, th they're checking our product all the time on that. So we have to send in samples like every few months so for the FCC. FCC determines yes. what power exactly. is Exactly, yes, and we cannot exceed that, yes sir. And it, is there, um, I was looking at the spec sheets and it's hard for me to put things in context you know, this this versus say cell phones versus is is there some resource where I could we I provided could, Shelley, you wanna yeah we can certainly um, put some of that information together in a subsequent meeting and okay, bring I'd that like back. Okay, I'd like to see that just sure. to <coughs> yep. yeah to be able to respond to be able to respond to to people's yes. concerns. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I also would, I just had one quick question. Did you ever, were you a, ever able to go to that field on a field trip to look at a work, the working system and? We have not been able to get that coordinated yet. Um, we did reach out to some agencies in Southern California that are working with Master Meter. They're not in a full, uh, full deployment yet. They're further along than us, but um, they still have, you know, a lot of uh, system to cover. Um, we did, I did call uh, the facility in Round Rock, Texas, and I haven't heard back from them yet, but I'm gonna keep trying to get a hold of them and see how it's working out for them. Uh, they also, um, I think, are the two agencies in Texas, they're using the My, uh, My Water Advisor customer app and portal, whereas in Southern California, nobody's deployed that yet, so I wanna get feedback on that too. Okay, demo time. Okay, so let's go ahead and this off. Okay, so um, what we're looking at here is the customer portal, um, My Water Advisor. Um, this puts uh, the end user in control where they can actually manage their own consumption. Um, as soon as they log in, they'll actually be able to see what they're forecasted to use by the end of the month um, and what they've used to date so far. Um, they can actually set an alert to uh, notify them. I, I do not want to go above a certain maximum consumption. If I get above that, please let me know. How's that notification happen? Um, so in settings, they can actually set that themselves just by going into the settings and manually typing that in and setting it to whatever they choose to. Um, if they don't want to go over. I understand the number, but. What happens when you it's get notified? Email or SMS. Number. That's right. So they'll, they'll get notified of a they can choose email either email them. or text message. Okay. Good. Um, same way with a leak. If they get a leak, they'll either get a text message or an email. Mm -hmm. They can choose what phone number okay. it goes to. Right. Um, Good. When they're on vacation, let's say they're going to be gone for uh, from such and such date to a uh, future date, they can actually set those dates and they can say if it goes above a certain gallon, notify me. Um, that way if any water goes to their meter while they're gone, uh, such as a leak, you know, if a leak happens while they're gone, they'll be notified right away. Right. 
<laughs> we'll also be able to uh, graph their consumption, um, which before the drive-by, we would actually have to go out and data log the register, get that to the customer. They'll, be, they'll have that at access uh, ready or available to them. Um, they can see hourly, daily, once they go AMI. Can I ask a question? So yeah. even though it only transmits every 12 hours, it's logging data how often? Um, so it goes down to five minutes, programmable down to five, five minutes. minutes. Okay. So it can actually store, um, it can only hold so many data points though, right. so the more often you store, the less it can hold uh, as a whole. Right, um, that's, if you pick five minutes, it must be able to handle that. That's right. Okay. <laughs> Um, you'll also be able to reach out to anybody that's using My Water Advisor. Um, I already have this open here, but you could send a <laughs> message to any user that's using the customer portal, and they'll either get that on their smartphone if they're using the app, or when they log in to the website, they'll be able to see those messages here. Oh, good spam. Leak notification. Um, also, if they want to reach out to the utility, they can do that and it will show up on our website as a envelope here in the top right. The utility can click on that and any incoming messages will be listed there. Let's go back. They have the ability to throw all, any leak in the area on our GIS system. And um, for example, if you have, can't use water from 8 a.m. to uh, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, if you want to see anybody in the area that was using water during that time, we could actually draw a polygon around a certain area and filter that down. We can run a consumption report for between hours and specify the days and hours we want to see. Blocked our pop up there, so we got to rerun it. Twice. So we could say the 10th and the 10th of, say, 8.30 a.m. So if we ever went to specific watering days or alternating watering days? Oh, for this is more of a, it says you couldn't flush the toilet, you couldn't give your kid a drink of water. You <laughs> well, you can yeah. specify a minimum consumption uh, and allow the user okay. a All certain right. amount of water. So I can, I don't know, that's probably hard to see. Let me see if I can make that a little bigger. So you can specify, I'm gonna disregard anything less than a certain amount of water. And then that'll eliminate that from the report. to find its way. Yes. It's going well, all the way to Texas. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long way to go. <laughs> I probably could have done a smaller area than what I, what I chose and would have been, made it a little quicker. Um, but once your uh, spreadsheet comes up, you can actually pull the top users, top consumers to the top. It's sortable, each column is sortable. So here's our, in the I presume, area. I presume this stuff is just for staff and not for individual customers? Yes, sir. Okay. 
Um, but they could see that in the hours I specified, uh, this customer used, and this is in gallons, um, 1,247 gallons in the hours that I specified on that day. Oh. So you could tell that that usage was more than, you know, a toilet like or, or something like that. <laughs> Hope so. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Shower. <laughs> a thousand weeks. <laughs> um, but there are several tools uh, available where they'll be able to manage uh, consumption. Build a water truck. <laughs> um, they've also have uh, a way to handle alerts. Um, any customer that has a leak will be listed here, and they can choose different ways to handle those. Um, for example, if I wanted to handle these two or three. Um, you can think of it as an alarm clock. You know, you want to snooze and sleep for 30 more minutes. You can snooze these leak alarms and choose a way to handle them, whether you want to do it sending a, a letter via email or mailing it. You can choose how many days I want to snooze the alarm for. Put any comments in that you'd like. And then, and they can specify what this letter actually says. They can change the wording, obviously, to say whatever they would like it to say. Um, but then you could mail this out to the customer or have it emailed. And this will be, even before we, if and when we upgrade to AMI, this feature will help us greatly with our, our current leak enforcement process, which is pretty manual. We haven't had a way to automate it, and th this will really help. And so um, it'll be nice. It'll help people have less water to pay for. <laughs> yeah, um, I, it'll just help too in, in the way that we um, process leaks from month to month and the way that we send letters out and now we have an email option so mm -hmm. it'll save a couple days on that. Um, yeah, just create more efficiency in our process. And then in 30 days, this will come back as a reminder, um, letting you know, hey, did this customer resolve their leak issues? Um, if so, I could archive that alarm, and then it goes into the history. Um, and it does keep a history on every customer's account, their past leaks. So you'll be able to see if they have another leak, did they have a leak the same time last year or, or last month, or uh, you'll be able to see that history, and it keeps that. <laughs> And I think um, Tyson will be going over this, but the yellow dot um, for the AMR, um, Allegro Mobile AMR, they'll all be yellow because there's not hourly or, uh, you know, f consumption being sent every five minutes. But when you do upgrade to AMI, you have the ability to do a lot more to categorize the severity of leaks and um, uh, you can customize that however you want. You can change it as frequently as you want. Um, we can do it ourselves, and that will categorize leaks as they come in and so help us prioritize, basically. Do you have the option of text messaging leaks with this software, too? You, um, not through the Harmony system. It's either um, a letter or an email, but the Harmony works in conjunction with the customer app and the portal, and the customer app, you can, they can select a text be sent to them. Now I'll say this, we, when we first rolled out the software, we did have that feature in there where you could send a text message instead of email. Um, we had some issues with it, so they took it out of the software, but it will be added later to where you'll be able to text and the you customer. Can, you can always email a text too, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so just considering our water situation, the sooner that a, a leak alert gets to somebody, the better. Well, with our phone situation, I don't always get my texts text until a week later. <laughs> Oh, really? Okay. Sometimes that happens, yeah. So I'd probably check Both. email and text. <laughs> <laughs> um, but just to elaborate a little bit on what she was saying, um, right now the only way it can calculate the, the leak level or the loss of water is by looking at the hourly reads. Um, unless they actually go out and data log the meter, it has no hourly reads to calculate that water loss from. Um, so, but once they go AMI, every meter will have hourly reads, and it'll be able to calculate how much water is actually being lost every hour. Um, and then they'll be able to decide 
is you know zero to 15 gallons uh, a yellow severity level is 15 to 35 an orange and then anything above 35 gallons an hour water loss is severe um, they'll be able to slide this and decide at that time what they you know decide is a severe leak and who's they the customer or oh, Staff, utility yeah. It, it'll help us prioritize um, to address those bigger leaks first mm -hmm. and then work down the list. Okay. The oh, the dashboard, yeah. I mean, just to see what they'll see when they... Just zoom in and out so you all can see that a little better. So every time they log in, this is uh, what they'll see as soon as they log in. And, uh, and this is staff. This is staff. Yeah. I'm sorry, I keep saying they. Uh, yeah. But the utility will see uh, just an overall view of their system, uh, meters that are no longer coming into the base station. They're not, they're not receiving um, an overall system status, how well the system is reading. And then as soon as they log in, this is really important, they'll see the critical alerts. So the ones that are categorized as severe leaks um, they'll see that right away as soon as they log in every time into Harmony. Consumption. Yeah, what's negative consumption? Going backwards. Oh. So what is negative consumption? So the meter can actually throw an alarm, uh, a CCW, which is a counterclockwise read. Um, but if it doesn't, let's say that alarm did not go off, but the read is less than what it was the last time the meter actually came into the system, then the system will throw a negative consumption. It's kind of a backup to the CCW alarm in case it doesn't it's see a, that. a backflow condition. That's so right. So the water is, is going in the opposite way that it should be going. And we do see that um, from time to time. Do they need a new backflow preventer? They either need a single check or, um, yeah, a backflow preventer. Uh, we've even seen it in single family homes where they maybe had a radiant heating system put in and the pump is, is causing that backflow condition. And so usually we can correct, have them correct that with a single check installed, which is only, you know, $300 to have a plumber install that and it doesn't have to be tested annually. So it, it accomplishes the objective yet saves the customer money. But in worst cases they do have to put in a backflow or the use is a commercial use and it should have a backflow anyways and they can adjust the severity of that just like they can the leaks you know how how much of a backflow is an issue or, or severe just the way they could with the leaks so how does this work with our current systems like if we currently have a system to deal with work orders so i see work orders up here so if we don't want to use these work orders, we want to use the ones we already have in our system. Yeah, we don't um, currently use um, the the precursor to this Harmony is Masterlinks, and we don't use the work order uh, process. Yeah, right. We use it through Springbrook. Right. Yeah. So, how do how do we integrate this system with our current system? Yeah. We and don't want to use what they've got if we don't want that to somehow send information into you know our current system. So, that, you know. We don't end up with two sets of work orders. Yeah, we, we just don't use this work order function. Um, when we do move to Tyler for our, our billing system, um, they have a really robust work order process and we're planning on going from the Springbrook to the Tyler um, for the work orders, electronic work orders. Does that answer? Well, in general, you know, this has certain information it's gonna produce and we, we want to, make use of it in other systems. So mm -hmm. it's about integration between two software systems. Because this may have something, some information that we need in another system because we don't want to use what this is attached to. We want to attach it to our own stuff that we already have. Well, we'll say this, export. the- Yeah, export. Mm -hmm. The billing software, uh, it automatically generates work orders depending on the information that it obtains, right? Mm -hmm. This doesn't do that. You have to manually, this isn't an elaborate work order system. Uh, the utilities that I see use this um, are utilities that don't have a good utility billing system in place. 
um, because you have to manually create the work orders. It doesn't integrate with the billing software at all. Like, yeah, I, I understand that. I wouldn't, wasn't saying we would use this, but for example, there are these alerts in here. From these alerts that you have noticed, we might want to then generate a work order, and we'd like not to do it manually. So how can we export the information from this system into our other system that we actually use so that we don't end up having to manually go over and type in a work order looking at this screen and that screen. Yeah, we're going to be looking for ways to, to integrate, integrate exactly. with Tyler. We have a utility that does that. Um, we put it in the interface mm -hmm. uh, to export that out just like when it's time to export the reads back to billing. Um, there will be a field where we'll put leak or, or whatever the alert may be that the meter sent out that month. That would go into Tyler. We have the capability to do that just as hopefully Tyler can accept it. Um, there are some features as well that will help with water loss, and I don't think we want to get into them in too much detail, but I think that will really help us um, with our own internal water loss determinations and, and calculations and addressing that in the future. Um, there's some new regulations out about water loss, and so this could really kind of streamline those calculations and be working with Christine on that part of it to make sure we take full advantage of that feature. Anything else you want me to touch on? Or? I think that about covers it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Tyson. So at what point would the, the, our customers wouldn't use the, their own mobile app until we had the AMI, right? Yeah, they wouldn't use it until we have the AMI. And I, we do that I in think a the best way to roll out the customer app is, is kind of that service area by service area. Um, That's why I was wondering, it might be something, you, if we do a small area to try it, yeah. it might be good to see how that works. Yeah, so rolling it out for this first area um, in Aptos, where we, we plan to do the pilot, um, I think is our approach, and see how that works. And then as we move on through the rest of the service area, we would roll it out to those as well. One thing I like is that we can then do comparisons and see if this app actually gets used mm -hmm. and how much it saves. Mm -hmm. As we can see, one area and another area, one has the fa fancy new thing, the other one has the old thing, and we can see how much it saves in terms of leak detections or other behavior changes or And comparing with the year before on each customer. Exactly, a backy, a true backy comparison. Mm -hmm. Looks good. Yeah, looks promising. Yeah, thanks for the demonstration. Yep. You're very welcome. And for the information. So what kind of schedule we let's hope they Now let's hope they last longer than seven years. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of schedule are we looking at? For We're, we've gotten, I think, about 10 of the, um, the mobile uh, registers in. And for the pilot, um, we're looking at completing the, the Aptos Village uh, development project as that comes online, getting the system in. So we're not going back out there later and doing that. Um, we're also looking at doing at least one or two routes in the area in the next couple of months and uh, seeing how that works. Yeah. And then in um, combination with that, we're, we're starting to um, look at what, what it's going to take to get the first collector station in. And um, I'm envisioning probably three months. Um, no, probably no sooner than three months getting that first collector station in and switching over to AMI. And so there'll be an education component to, with the customers There's going to be an outreach component, as okay. yeah, and an educational component. I think doing customers, rather than just new stuff, customers that have been there for a while for comparison's sake would mm -hmm. be the most valuable. Yep. How about registers that are failing? The registers that are failing, um, we're, we're gonna need to start um, putting in the hybrid as they fail. I mean, we right now we have um, 
the 3G AMR registers, I think we have about 500 of those left, Chris, that were free to us, they're under warranty, and so we wanna get those in, and hopefully that gets us a little bit ahead of the curve so that we can then shift over to putting in these hybrid registers, yeah. But that'll, that'll happen at some point. That that'll happen. All the um, bad ones will We're thinking um, a two-year deployment uh, because we we want to take advantage of all these features that this offers. We don't want to stretch this out, you know, more than two years. We want to get get these in and, and take advantage of these benefits. Um, we also have to do something now, and so it, it just makes sense to just switch over instead of replacing the 3G with 3G um, until we can get ahead. So, how long have these been meters been in use? The, um, the 3G new? AMR meters and registers, they first started putting them in in 2007. Oh, no, I'm talking about the new ones. Oh, the new ones. We just got the first ones in. Um, we got some in on Friday. And, and you some means in, in practice. practice. Are they yeah. proven? Oh. Yeah, that's what um, I mean. In other areas. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay, so some bugs have been worked out, I imagine? Yes. I don't, I don't think it's necessary, it. thanks. And yeah. then, um, not to mention, we took some other steps where these actually go to sleep at night where it's not doing that five minute, it's not. Yeah, I got you, so you so, improved it. Yes. So, but that's, a, you know, we want to do this as soon as possible, and yet, if there's, if this product is ramping up and becoming better and better, that you wait. can make an argument to wait, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, is it changing or is it pretty static now? It's pretty static. Okay. It's, it's set now. Okay. On the, on the ones up here that I showed you, the Allegro. Okay. So, do you ha do you handle the those districts in um, Texas too? I don't. I, you don't I cover California. Just California. So, are there any other areas or districts that have? Yeah, Ed's put us in touch with um, on City of Ontario. Uh, Loma, Linda, and La Habra. Uh, so we've, we've talked to those folks and okay. they're more than willing to share information and, and you know, have us down for a visit. But like I said, they're early on in their process. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's still stuff we can learn from them, but I think, uh, you know, looking at what they're doing in Texas and because they're further along is going to be really helpful. Yeah, I'd, I'd really like to see that happen. Okay. Uh, just real time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then in, in the memo, Shelly, you talk about um, the meters are being tested in, in Santa Cruz. Yeah. And so uh, any word on when that information is going to be done or how, it, how it's turning did, out? Did he say? I would assume this yeah. Okay, so we'll know soon. Yeah, we pulled um, some of the meters from the earliest route that yeah. we installed. So they've been in the ground just a little over 10 years. And we just want to confirm that those meters are still reading accurately. They do have a 20 year uh, full warranty. Sure. So um, before we, you know, just go and swap out registers, we want to right. yeah, make sure that we're Sounds also. Good. Have we figured out how much money we have both in conditional Wilsers waiting to do their thing and the new Wilsers waiting to do their thing yeah. and the other half of each one of these that has been yep. approved? We have a full accounting of all the, the revenue, the funds that we've pulled in through the Water Demand Offset Program. How much is that? Um, boy, I want to say it's around $600,000. Yeah, um, don't, yeah, I'm not exact on that because I haven't Right. looked at it in a little while but um, so we could do half of the first year just like that yeah Good. you need anything else from us some kind of action mm -hmm. yeah. there's there's no, there's action, no action it's just a uh, provide direction be back so you'll be back on the 17th next month yep more information do you want to open to the public yeah we should open to the yeah. public. oh yeah Public. 
please comment. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner from Aptos. So um, how safe is this? Um, it's giving off radio transmissions and how safe is it from being hacked? Um, can it ostensibly in the future, could somebody go in and hack and turn off water s service uh, to a home or a, a neighborhood? Um, I'm curious about the um, future tower locations, the repeaters, and what their um, power would be. And I want to know if there's going to be an opt-out ability for customers who really don't want another smart meter in their home or have refused a smart meter from PG&E. Um, I'm a little concerned because I live in a canyon and I'm going to be going through a whole <laughs> a whole barrage of this. I'm not one of your customers, but I'll be driving through or bicycling through um, the canyon with all kinds of things. And this drawing, this illustration on page 248 really makes me um, worried about that. I live out in the mountains without cell phone service for a reason um, because my family members are sensitive to this kind of stuff, and yet here it is going to be saturating the canyon that I, m I and my family will have to have to travel through. We have no option. So I do have concerns about it. Um, I do have, uh, I've, I've read page 249 and looked at some of the, the frequencies and the power, so I understand that, but I'm still I'm still worried, and I don't know what you just said, but I am worried. Thank you. Well, for one thing, as I found out, instead of this thing blasting every 11 seconds, I mean, w our entire system now is AMRs, and you can opt out. We have a it costs you, but you can opt out, and I'm sure we'll continue that process if you want. But it's going to go from the thing clicking every 11 seconds to, you know, much less frequent. So you want this. You want, it's going to be better than what we have now. The other thing, the electromagnetic radiation dissipates within a few feet quite dramatically. Mm -hmm. So, And almost none of these go in the home. Instead, they go up by the street. So unlike PG&E, which typically goes on the side of a house, this one's usually not on the property at all. It's in the... <coughs> in the space out front there. Yeah. I am I am interested in I noticed that it's a bi-directional. So what is the bi the bi the back direction used for? I know you, you've talked about the you can turn on the, the the sending, but what else is the back direction used for? We we can summons uh, final reads yes. from the system. Right. So that that's pretty much the main bi-directional feature. There's not a remote shutoff right. um, per se with the system and um, what we've learned is that uh, there's a lot of problems with those add-on uh, remote shutoff mm -hmm. yeah. systems that we probably don't want to uh, do those. Mm -hmm. um, there's some liability concerns with the remote shutoff. We were talking about that today. They have to exercise every day. Uh, there was a utility that I heard about that went with some of them. And because it has to exercise for five minutes every day, otherwise it could stick, they had the time wrong and it, they were all set for 7.30 a.m. No. Uh, we were in the shower and it shut off. The, uh, the, other, the other part is that we're looking at as manufacturers looking at the litigation, if that fails closed, if it fails and that shuts down and you can't get water, there's a fire or you need water for whatever reason, that's another issue itself. And thirdly is the cost. Mm -hmm. They're like $125 each. And they only have a year warranty. Yeah, mm -hmm. so. And I noticed that it was also encryption of the data that does get sent, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
We have a closed session, so uh, we're going to be doing that next. And so goodbye. Thanks for coming. <laughs>